cost is going to be, there's a $50 deposit, but then the cost will be $150 per person plus four meals. Please plan for that. They will leave Friday at 8 a.m. from the face and return Saturday evening. Anyone attending younger than sixth grade must have a parent or adult responsible with them. Please remember uh, the Pitts family. Linda Pitts passed away June 11th. Let's please remember to keep her family in our prayers. The Rosewood Devo this week will be from 2 to 2.30. The adult class that meets in room 107 will be responsible for that Devo. Uh, this evening we're continuing the summer series. We're very excited to have uh, Aaron Foster with us from the Boonville Church of Christ. He's the college minister there. Um, so we're very excited to have him there. Uh, the dismissal prayer will be by Max Parham. And at this time, please grab a songbook as James Taylor leads us. You'll get your songbooks, Mark number 687, 687 is our song of invitation. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, 687. <clears throat> If you will, turn to number 154, 154. Give me the Bible. Sing uh, verses 1, 2, and 4. <clears throat> Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer, lone and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that greatest peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. visit here last year really surprised you let me come back but that's okay I'm back and uh, I'm really glad that I am uh, number two you may not invite me back again because I may be the only visiting preacher you have in this summer series that comes with his work clothes on 
If you forget my name, it'll just be right here on my shirt. Uh, when you're walking past, you can just look and you'll know exactly who I am. Uh, number three, I'm no longer the college minister at Boonville, so y'all definitely won't invite me back now. Um, it's not because I got fired, it's just simply because I have kids that are 14 to 6, and I'm a general manager at Toyota, and I just couldn't give the time that I wanted to to the college students there, and I just had to make a decision that, uh, quite frankly, I, I needed to step back and let somebody who had more time. I tell you all that for number four. If I do decent, invite me back, because I love preaching, okay? I love preaching. And I love preaching because there's no greater service than to spread God's Word and to serve Him. And whenever you work 60 hours a week at Toyota doing what we do, you cherish these times that people offer you and give you to serve God. And so I thank you for that. And I'm humbled to be here. And so uh, with that, I will say, three of my kids are at... Um, Maywood, which I think is most of your people are. Cassie, is the clicker up there? Did I lose that already? Um, which is where I think most of your people are. So uh, I know they would, they would like to be here. But my, my youngest, who's sitting by Caitlin there, my youngest is the, obviously the fourth one, and he is loving life, people. He is loving life. He's never had this much room to talk and so much time to talk. And uh, he is, he's just loving it. So he's hoping they don't come back. <laughs> but I know y'all are looking forward for your people to come back just like we are for, for my children to come back. Um, I think that's, that's what I want to say as an introduction. And, and well, I say as before I start what I want to talk to you about. And <laughs> listen, anybody who knows me knows I'm not one of these, you know, everybody's got to be happy people. Matter of fact, if you know me, you know that this is something I struggle with a lot. And, uh, but I want to ask you this question to lead into really what I want to talk to you about. How happy are you tonight? And if I was to, to just ask you to categorize it in certain dimensions of your life, spiritually, how happy are you tonight? In regards to your family life, how happy are you tonight? In your work life, how happy are you tonight? I'm going to tell you the reason why this is the subject that I want to talk to you about is because I have been working on this, and specifically the little subtitle I have down there about my attitude, I have been working on this extremely hard the last year of my life, last year and a half of my life. One thing we know is that over time, we as Americans are gradually becoming more unhappy. Now you can have your reasons why that might be. I'm okay with that. That's not my subject tonight. I'm sure you have great theories about why we're so unhappy or we're getting more unhappy. Not so we're so unhappy, but it is a fact that people have been researching. But it leads me to really what I told you I've been working on, which is my attitude. Because what I have found, unfortunately for me, is that depending on how my day goes, depending on my happiness level, depending on whether or not my wife has cleaned the bedroom when I get home at night, depends on my attitude. And unfortunately, that probably shouldn't be the case, should it? So I started working on this. I'm going to tell you why I started working on this last year. I was at work, and somebody came up to me, and they said, Aaron, are you okay? You, don't tell me I'm the only person that gets that on occasion. They said, Aaron, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm okay. Nothing's wrong. Yeah, I'm fine. Why are you asking me if I'm okay? Well, you just look like something's wrong. Well, the first time that happened, I just, that was their problem. And then, Doug, it happened again. And it happened again. There's a book that I really love that I tell people about, and it's called The Energy Bus. And it says that people can feel your emotions 
from up to four feet away from you. Apparently, they could feel me for a mile, and it wasn't so good. So I finally reflected on that, and I said, obviously, obviously my attitude, the way that I'm presenting myself, the way that I'm you know, sharing my emotions, whatever it might be, is hurting my relationships. Now, Doug texted me and he said, hey, I hope you can come one of these nights. And he says, of course, all you, you just need to preach whatever you think the church needs to hear. Paraphrasing what Doug said. Doug, that's how I read it. I'm telling you what Aaron Foster needs to hear tonight. But something tells me I may not be the only person that needs to hear this message. Because let me tell you, and I got in trouble. Look, I'm not a full-time minister. I got in trouble for saying these words. This is my opinion. They said, anyways, that's okay. This, what I'm about to tell you, is my opinion. Sin hurts our influence on people, but folks, our attitude will hurt our influence on people too. And I told myself, Aaron, you serve a great God. And you have a Savior that died for you. And the Lord has blessed you beyond all means why in the world does somebody have to come to you and say, is something wrong? I needed an attitude check. And I've been working on it for a year and a half. My wife will tell you I'm failing more than I'm doing well. But I'm at least trying. But then I went to God's Word and I said, who? Who can I study? Who is somebody that that had ups and downs and had a lot of things happen to them, but yet always seemed to have the disposition and the demeanor and the attitude that I want to have. And I came, up with, I came up with Joseph. So I studied Joseph for about four or five months. And today I'm going to summarize my study in about 20 more minutes, okay? That's what I'm going to ask of you, about 20 more minutes. I hope. So... We're going to start, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter, we're really going to start in chapter 37, okay? So Genesis chapter 37, uh, I have chapter 28 up there because basically this, I, I think the life of Jacob starts at that point. There's a lot you need to learn if you're going to study Joseph through that, through that reading. But we're going to start in, in chapter 37, so if you don't mind, turn your Bibles there. We're going to do this kind of quickly, um, but I, I know all of you know his story, I get it. All of you know most of what I'm going to share with you, but I think we've got to set the stage for three points I want to make tonight about how to have the proper attitude, okay? So let's start in chapter 37, and I, and look, I may get in trouble. I, I shouldn't do that. I would normally ask for a little bit of participation here, but I, I won't do that, even though I think we call this Wednesday night Bible study, so I mean, I think it's probably okay as long as I still lead, but we, I won't do that tonight, not at this moment. So let's start with Joseph's life. What do we know about him when he was younger? Every kid can tell me that. The coat of many colors, right? The coat of many colors. He had this coat of many colors that was given to him by his father because he was his father's favorite. And because he was his father's favorite, we know that he wasn't his brother's favorite, right? We know that. Uh, there's something else, though, that you may miss. And I think most of you know this because you're very wise and you've read the Bible. But what else about Joseph made it difficult for him at an early age. Who did he not have around? His mother. Remember, she died when she was giving birth to Benjamin. And so he was raised with somebody who I can't imagine not living with. But he did. And that was his mom. And then on top of that, his brothers hated him. We know about the dreams. He had the dream of the she his brother's sheaves bowing down to him and then uh, to his sheep and then the, the moon and the stars, uh, the moon, the sun, and the, and the 11 stars bowing down to him. And he told his brothers those dreams. I don't know why he thought his brothers would appreciate that, but he told his brothers those dreams and they hated him. So much to the point to where when, when his father sent him to go, to go bring uh, food to him and take care of him uh, while they were up north of where they lived, his brothers wanted to kill him. They were going to kill him until Reuben, the oldest, talked him out of it. But now he only talked him out of it because he was just wanting to be his father's favorite. 
But instead, they threw him in a pit. You know the story. They threw him in the pit. Judah decided, well, why don't we just sell him to the, uh, to the Midianites going toward Egypt? And they did. Sold him for 20 shekels. She- shekels. And um, now he's a slave to the Midianites. All right. We know what happens. That starts in chapter 37. We know what happens starting in chapter 39. He gets a part of Pharaoh's household. He's now a part of Pharaoh's household. Joseph is awesome. The Bible actually says that God was with Joseph and he made him a successful man. That's what the Bible says. So he was successful in everything that he did, including as a slave and and, and Potiphar's, sorry, house. He became in charge of all that Potiphar had. But the Bible also says that like me, Joseph was a very handsome man. I just want to make sure some of you are awake. That's the only reason why I did that. Y'all stay with me. I'll get through this soon. That he was a handsome man. And Potiphar's wife saw that and day after day, it says, tempted him. But there was one time that we all know he was alone. She basically attacked him. He ran. She got him in trouble. He got thrown into prison. Fourth or fifth thing bad that's happened to Joseph so far, and he's not even 30 yet. He's now in prison. This is interesting. This is not a part of my lesson, but I wrote it down in my notes because I I, I recognize what he did. While he was in prison, of course, God made him successful. He became in charge of everything again while he was in prison. And yet there was a cupbearer and a baker that show up that was a part of Pharaoh's servants. And because Joseph was who he was, he simply asked him, what's wrong with you today? And when he did that, he opened up the door for them to tell him all about their life. That's not a part of my story, but you you need to remember that. And so they told him about the dreams and they told him about the dreams they were having and and Joseph told him the bad news. He said, okay, cupbearer, you're going to survive. It's okay. Pharaoh's going to bring you back. But Baker, you're going to die. You're not going to make it. He said, so cupbearer, do me a favor. When you get back to Pharaoh's kingdom, would you please tell him about me? And we know that he didn't. For two years, he didn't. For two years, Joseph stayed in that cell. Joseph did whatever he had to do until Pharaoh had the dreams. And we know he had two dreams. Thin cows, plump cows, thin sheaves, plump sheaves. And we know what Joseph they, nobody could interpret it, so they call on Joseph. Joseph comes out, and Joseph says, look, seven years of famine, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. That's what it means. He becomes second in charge only to Pharaoh at age 30. Joseph was an impressive young man. He guides them through this famine, and we know that his brothers need help. The same ones who try to kill him, so they come back. There's some interactions a couple of times with Joseph. He tests them a couple of times. But we know in the end, Joseph helps them. Joseph helps his brothers, and then they make it through the famine. But now I want you to make sure you're in chapter 50, because now now's where the lesson really begins. Joseph helps his brothers, and everything's going fine. He moves Jacob. Benjamin shows up. Everybody, he moves Jacob and the whole family to Egypt to take care of them. But in chapter 50, we learn that Jacob dies. And when Jacob dies, his brothers get worried. They're worried that now that dad's gone, Joseph is going to do what most of us would do to them take care of, punish them for what they had did to him. But he doesn't. And instead, we know all these things is what I've explained. And instead, we read what he tells them, okay? So I want to read this with you if you don't mind. Sorry, I'm turning. Let me, let me open it up in my, in my iPad right here so I don't have to turn and talk away from him. He says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, 
They said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of, the God of your father. One more thing I want to tell you about Joseph's life. You read here in, in verse 17, it says, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Joseph wept seven times from what I counted from the times I started reading him in chapter 37 to chapter 50. Joseph wept seven times. This was just one of many times that he wasn't afraid to show who he was and his emotions. But he finishes this with verse 18. He says, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. Now here it is. Here's the lesson tonight. We'll take three points from it. He says in verse 19, but Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke to them kindly. Okay, I have three quick points that I want to make for you tonight, if, and then the lesson will be yours. Again, when I look at Joseph's life, all the bad things that happened to him, I wonder how was he able to manage it? How was he able to have the attitude and the demeanor and, the, and, and, and treat people the way that he treated people? And I think this, verse 19 through 21, sums it up for me. So I want to start with this. Point number one, to keep the proper attitude you need to remember and know your place. Now what I mean by that is, he immediately told his, told his brothers, he said, am I in the place of God? They said, don't harm us, don't do anything to us. And he immediately says, I'm not God, that's not my place to do so. And sometimes, and I'm going to be, look, relationships one-on-one -on -one right here. If you want to connect with people, be vulnerable and be open. So I will give trust to you again tonight. One of my struggles is that I forget my place. And because of that, by the way, I'll even be more open, apparently, Anybody, had, anybody ever read the book, His Needs, Her Needs? Am, oh, one, oh, yeah, okay, my wife and I are the only ones that need that, apparently. Okay, well, some of you need to read that book. In that, you learn about what is your needs and what your wife needs, and then you figure out, I'll be blunt, I thought I was doing really good, then I realized I wasn't doing anything she wanted. But one of my greatest needs is adoration. And guys, I'm not the only one who has that need. I need my wife and I need others to pat me on the back and tell me how awesome I am at times. But unfortunately, because I have that attitude and I have that characteristic, I feel entitled at times. I feel like some people owe me things. Or I feel like that there's some things I don't necessarily have to do, and there's definitely things I shouldn't have to endure. But if we will remember our place, as Joseph did, then we'll never forget that our duty and purpose is to serve God and serve others. And when you don't forget that, then some of this entitlement that I'm afraid some of us have, we realize should not affect our attitude at all. There's so many times I let the smallest things get in the way. So many times that something simple will happen and there it goes. But if I can just remember my place, remember who I belong to and who I really am, which is a servant of God, 
How many situations in our life would just roll off our back and we would just go on like nothing ever happened? But I'm telling you, one of my biggest problems is I forget my place. Joseph never did. At a time where he could have easily paid back every wrongdoing that those brothers ever did to him, he did not forget his place. Whenever he was in prison, sitting there for two years, he never forgot his place. Whenever he was sold into slavery and he was in Potiphar's house, he never forgot his place. And that's why I believe one point he was able to have the attitude that we all want and have the, the life and, and the demeanor that we all desire. Point number two. This is a big one for me. He had the proper perspective. I want you to turn to a verse that's in Genesis 40, verse 15. Please turn there because I want you to read this. Genesis 40, verse 15. I forgot to have you turn to my other verse on point number one, so forgive me. Genesis 40, verse 15, though, I want you to turn there. This is a very subtle moment, but to me this is huge. Now, I told you about him being in prison for two years. He's talking to the cupbearer and to the baker, and he's telling them his story. And catch what he says in verse 15 about how or why he ended up where he is. See if you can catch it. He told them, he said, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. Now, when I read through that the first time when I was studying, I didn't catch it. When I read through it the second time, it caught my attention. And this is the reason why. Was he stolen out of the land of the Hebrews? No. He had 11 brothers who wanted to kill him and get rid of him, and that's why he left the land of the Hebrews. That's how we would have thought it, right? But note his perspective on that situation. His perspective on that situation was not that he had a family who hated him and a family who wanted to get rid of him and a family who wanted to kill him, but simply that he was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. Isn't that an awesome perspective for him to have and to understand? Uh-oh, don't go there yet. All right. I have something Tim works with me, so he's heard this before, but I have this phrase that I got from uh, that book, The Energy Bus, that I just want to share with you real quick. It's E plus P equals O. All right? E plus P equals O. You can't control the events that happen to you at times. But every single one of us can control our perspective, P. And when you control your perspective, it will predict your outcome, O. The problem with many of us and myself is we have these events happen to us and we don't think we can control the outcome, E equals O. But that's not the case. Just as Joseph, our perspective on that can be the case. And happiness advantage, one of the things he says is that your brain... Your brain, your eyes take in 11 million bits of information. You can look that up on Google. But your brain can only process 40 bits of information. Now take that in. You have the potential to take in 11 million, I'm constantly seeing about 11 million bits of information every second. But I can only process 40 bits of information per second. And what that teaches me it's the same thing Joseph understood, which is what you choose to focus on will be how the outcome will be. And what you think about and how you'll act and how your attitude will be. Unfortunately for myself, too many times I focus on the negative. Too many times I focus on all the bad things that are happening instead of having the proper perspective. Now, you, this is a biblical principle taught in many different locations. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. You ought to be happy, brother, when people do that. 
Without the proper perspective, there's no way that can be true. But then he gives us a perspective. He says, when you do that for my sake. And then he says, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. When we have the proper perspective, when we know our place and we have the proper perspective, we can put everything in its box the way it ought to be. And it should not take control of our lives. Because we know we're living a life for God. And at the end of time, everything's going to be unimaginably amazing. But I forget that. I forget that. So then, we get to the last point. Joseph understood his purpose and plan. He said, you meant it for evil. By the way, I should have referenced that verse on the last point. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Right perspective. For three, he says, so we could save lives. So God could use me to save souls, save lives. I didn't, I I paraphrase that, so forgive me. The last point that I want you to understand, I'll do this quick and then I'll close. God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're going through. I don't even know how your attitude is tonight. But what I hope I can leave you with is that if you're serving God, you're here for a reason. You're there for a reason. And we should never, ever forget that. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. I put this on my truck whenever I was trying to do better at my attitude, and I placed this, I wrote it on a note card, and I put it on my dashboard. I know. And I read it. I try to read it daily, and I try to memorize it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. You'll recognize verse 12, because, because in verse 12 it says, Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, with fear and trembling. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 13. He says, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and work his good pleasure. Let that sink in a little bit. Paul says... It is God who is at work in you. But I'm here to tell you that I think we forget that and our attitude shows it. But if we can remember our place, remember the perspective, and remember that God has a purpose and a plan for us because He's at work in us both to will and to work His good pleasure. That is what ought to be happening in our lives every single day to everybody we come in contact with. Now, I know you're not perfect. And Lord knows I'm not perfect. But I'm here to suggest tonight that the devil's convinced us that we can walk around with a poor attitude and that's not sin. I think the devil's convinced us that it's okay for us to walk around and just be, this is terrible, blah, and it's okay. And I'm trying to convince you, and I saw a lot of friendly faces tonight, by the way, y'all, y'all are such visiting folks. If we would leave those doors tonight, happy excited, energetic, with the proper attitude because we know who we are. We know what our goal, our job is. We have the right perspective. Y'all would fill this building up. But people don't ask us, what makes you so special? What makes your attitude so special? They weren't asking me. 
And I realized last year, because of that, I wasn't showing God working in me. I want to do one more thing, if you don't mind. This may be what actually fires me, but I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm in control, everybody. I'm in control. If you have a partner, I would love for you. You don't have to do this. If, 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 if you don't have a partner, just watch because it's fun. But if you have a partner, I want you to pair up. You don't have a partner. You're just going to have to watch. Everybody pair up, okay? Pair up. Say, I'm one and I'm two. All right. If you're a pair, say, I'm number one. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Number one. Who's number one? This is important. Y'all got to follow instructions. Number one. Okay. This is your goal. No, this is all I'm asking you to do. I want you to look into the eyes of number two. Oh, this is going to be really good. Everybody film this one over here. I want you to look into the eyes of number two. And I want you to simply smile. Now look, there's a rule to this. People know a fake smile. And by the way, they know a fake smile because they don't see the crinkle in your eyes, okay? Know that in life. If they don't see the crinkle in your eyes, you can, you, can, you can grin all you want to. It doesn't matter. But if they can see the crinkle in your eyes, then they know you mean it. So I'm asking you to put the crinkles in your eyes, number one. Look at number two and smile. Number two, you have a job. Hold up, stop. Y'all don't do it yet. Number two, you have a job. I'm counting down seven seconds on this clock. Your only job is not to smile back. Stop smiling at this moment, number two. Number two, you are not allowed to smile. Number one, when I say start, you smile, crinkle in the eyes. Number two, you do not smile, okay? On your mark, get set, go. Seven seconds is all I'm asking for. You can do it. All right, time's up. Time's up. Time's up. How many of you, sm number twos, how many of you did not smile, raise your hand? I bet people could pick you out already. Yep, I could pick you out already. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, brother. I'm just kidding. How many of you smiled, number twos, raise your hand? What, I told you not to smile. Y'all tell me how come you smiled? Because people can feel you from up to four feet away. Now tell me why we're not doing that more. The statistics say, by the way, that 70% of you is going to smile, 30% of you are not. So just so you know, that's about what happened here. But why wouldn't you smile? When you know, when you look at somebody in the eyes and you've got the crinkle in the eyes, that they're going to smile back. But I hope that Joseph has taught you tonight a few ways to help you smile a little bit more. Because, folks, God is an amazing God. And every single one of you in here are blessed. And we owe it to Him to smile. Now, I do have to have a disciplinary. Or, uh, I should have just stopped, but that's not who I am. I get some of us don't smile very, very often, and I'm not just, it's okay. But y'all get my point tonight, okay? Well, my daddy taught me a long time ago, you do not preach without offering the invitation. The reason why I can smile is because I've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. The reason why many of you can smile is because you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you haven't been, though, we only ask you to do what Peter told those to do at Pentecost. Repent, be baptized for the remission of sins. I'm sure the water is ready tonight. Of course, based off your belief and your confession, we can make that happen tonight. But if you are a Christian and you have not been living the way you ought to live, if you haven't had the attitude that you ought to have, if you haven't just showing the world what it means to be a Christian, there's no reason for you to walk out of here tonight not being sure of your salvation. If there is any way 
we can assist you tonight. Please come now while we stand and while we sing. You will stand and sing number seven, number seven, as 
were dismissed, abide with me. We ask at this time that you be with Miss Mary, <clears throat> be with her tomorrow and through the rest of our journey, and let her find comfort through you. We thank you for Aaron Foster and his family. We thank you for his gift that he has to present your lesson, and we pray that you will present him with more opportunities to share your word and to influence others. At this time, we pray for the Pitts family. We pray that they can find comfort in you that can be found nowhere else. As we go throughout our lives, dear Lord, as we struggle to find happiness in a broken world, we pray that you will guide us to find the only true happiness that is with you in your kingdom in heaven. And the only path is through your Son, Jesus Christ. Be with us through the rest of the week. And bring us back the next point in time. Forgive us for our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.